Good afternoon. Um, thanks to everyone for joining this afternoon. It is my pleasure um, to be able to host this book launch event. My name is Mary McCord. I am currently the legal director of the Institute for Constitutional Advocacy and Protection, or ICAP, at Georgetown University Law Center and also a visiting professor there. But you may say, what relevance does that have to our topic today? And the relevance really comes from my previous uh, life where I um, ended a, a, a lengthy career at the Department of Justice and uh, finished up that career in the National Security Division with three years as the Principal Deputy Assistant Attorney General for National Security and my last six months as the Acting Assistant Attorney General for National Security. That three-year span in the National Security Division after 20 years in the U.S. Attorney's Office in D.C. included the exact time period at which uh, ISIS declared the caliphate. Um, we had an operational pace of investigations and prosecutions that had been unrivaled since the period immediately after 9-11 and is really the time period that much of the work in the book we are here to talk about today covers. Uh, and, and indeed, I actually transferred over from the U.S. Attorney's Office to the National Security Division in May of 2014. And later that month, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi declared the caliphate. So um, I feel like I uh, lived the experience that, that um, our authors have are here to talk about today. The book, of course, is Homegrown, ISIS in America. And I'm pleased to introduce Seamus Hughes, who is the Deputy Director of G uh, George Washington University's program on extremism. He and I first met while I was still in the government. Um, and so we go back a number of years. He is one of the authors of this book, as is Bennett Clifford, the senior research fellow at the program on extremism. The third uh, author, Alexander Mal Maliagro um, Hitchens, is, was, is the research director at the Program on Extremism, also a lecturer in war studies at King's College in London, and will not be, unfortunately will not be able to join us today. He has had a family emergency, everything is okay, but he won't be able to join. So we will be looking to Seamus and Bennett to, to uh, take us through a series of questions about the book, about their research, about their findings, and then we'll open it up to audience questions. So I'm gonna let Seamus kick us off with some comments here. And then I have a number of questions, but I really will be looking to the audience um, uh, for your questions. So be thinking of them now. Thank you. And thank you very much, Mary. You've been a friend of the program for a number of years and uh, we were hosting you when you were at the National Security Division and, and now we're hosting you as a fellow here at the program. Um, you've always been a good sounding board for us um, and, and the good work on this. And in fact, your name comes up quite a bit in the book because um, you prosecuted a number of these cases. Um, I just wanted to say uh, on the offset, um, thank you to the program on extremism um, for allowing Bennett, Alex and I um, the freedom to do this, this type of work. Uh, in particular, our director, Lorenzo Vedino, who when we had this idea three years ago, um, didn't hesitate and said, you know, run with it uh, and do whatever you need to do in order to get um, the story. And so I am appreciative of, of Lorenzo and also the larger um, cadre of folks that we leaned on, whether it be John Lewis or um, Andrew Mines or Devorah uh, Hararo. These are folks that, that are experts in the field and we're fortunate to have them um, as people to, to train and, and think through these questions for. So like I said, we've been working on this book for three years, um, you know, before I had gray hair and the beard, before I even had a beard. Um, and what we did was we looked at it in, in many different ways. Um, we took a, basically, the idea was to take a challenge. Um, you know, it's pretty ambitious to say what is the threat of homegrown violent extremism in the US. Um, it's one thing to track uh, a news story. It's another thing to track all the news stories together and then dig. So we went through about 20,000 pages of legal documents. Um, Bennett, Alex, and I traveled to courthouses around the country. Uh, we filed motions to unseal many of the documents that Mary tried to keep sealed, right? So we uh, released about 1,000 plus documents because of that. We filed numerous uh, Freedom of Information Act requests, uh, got rejected by a bunch of them, and then appealed and appealed and appealed until we got more. We interviewed FBI agents, um, US attorneys, defense attorneys, family members, and also returning foreign fighters. So Americans who traveled to Syria and Iraq, they've come back to get a sense of their experience. Uh, and what we learned was um, the, the nature of homegrown ISIS support in the US is diverse. Uh, 
it runs the gamut. So the FBI says there's a thousand active investigations in all 50 states. That number stayed steady for quite a while. But 2014, 15 timeframe was basically the banner time for ISIS. All the lights were blinking red on this. The FBI has arrested something north of 200 plus people for ISIS related activities, ranging from material support to terrorism, which has a recommended sentence of 20 years to false statements, to gun charges, to everything in between, to state and local um, uh, charges too. Like I said, the, the threat is diverse. You know, there's not a typical profile of an ISIS recruit. They're old, they're young, they're rich, they're poor, they're converts, they're reverts, they're everything in between, right? Um, there's not a rhyme or reason to a, a profile. Um, now they all share the same ideology, the, the same narrative, but they come at it a different um, direction. Some individuals are drawn to violence. Some people just wanna watch the world burn. But a good number of people that we studied in the book and we interviewed um, talked a lot about this idea of building a, a so-called caliphate. That was a driver for a lot of the folks, the societal building of it. It's the reason why in 2015, we had 65 different arrests for ISIS-related activities. A lot of people heard that siren call from Baghdadi and decided to get on, try to get on a plane and travel. Now, most of them were unsuccessful, and Bennett will, will dive into this a little bit in the question and answer, but um, a vast majority of these individuals were arrested by the FBI prior to, um, prior to traveling, but the ones that did um, rose to the ranks pretty significantly. In fact, Americans punch above their weight when it comes to terrorist organizations overseas. The folks that did get arrested um, tended to um, be found guilty by a jury, their peers or plead out. Their sentencing was 11.2 years looking at the data. And the story of, of homegrown terrorism in the US is stories of ones and twos and not fours and fives. Um, you're talking about a relatively small mobilization pool compared to our European partners. And so that means that the nature of the threat in the US is much more uh, diverse than, than other places. You know, it tends to occur, uh, there tends to be an online dynamic, but we can't discount the personal interactions. You're more likely to join a terrorist organization if your best friend joins a terrorist organization next to you. And so those in-person dynamics matter, particularly in a place like Minnesota, where individuals who traveled to ISIS were the brothers, sisters, and roommates of individuals who went for the prior mobilization of Al-Shabaab in Somalia. And so that's just the general quick and dirty overview. But I would say that you know, Bennett, Alex, and I um, took this as, as a challenge in terms of, uh, you know, I like a puzzle. And um, why an American who plays pickup ball at the Brian Cole Rec Center in Minnesota decides to go join the Islamic State in Raqqa um, is a puzzle for me. And I'd like to figure it out why. And so we're diggers by our very nature. And if we didn't know the answer, we're getting on a plane and figuring that out. Uh, we're rolling up our sleeves, we're talking to FBI agents, we're talking to family members, we're talking to anyone who will talk to us um, because we wanted to get a full extent of what we're talking about when it looks at ISIS in America. So with that, maybe I'll stop and, and, and kick it back to you, Mary. Yeah, well, one of the things I want to pick right up on one of the um, uh, comments you just made, which about which was that there was no single profile of the ISIS supporter. And I can say that we saw that, too, when I was over at the Justice Department. It wasn't like, which, of course, made the FBI's work even more difficult. It's not like they could just sort of focus on one geographic segment of the population. It wasn't like they could focus on one um uh, you know, socioeconomic sector. Now, there was somewhat of a relative youthfulness, I'd say, we thought, um, among those who were inclined to either travel or later to commit some sort of terrorist act or plan to commit some sort of terrorist act here at home. But even that uh, was not exclusive. So I guess I'm wondering to you, to you, Bennett, um, what, what accounts for the appeal across the socioeconomic, ethnic, political, geographic divides of ISIS? And how is that different from the appeal of Al Qaeda, you know, its pre a predecessor organization? Uh, thank you, uh, Professor McCord. It's a, it's a great question. And before I answer it, I also have to uh, give my thanks to not only extend Seamus's thanks to the program and its staff and its director, Lorenzo Vidino, uh, but also to everybody else who uh, supported us, uh, all three of our authors during the book as well. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention uh, my family, uh, my wonderful fiance, Dawn, uh, and everyone else, um, colleagues, uh, other folks throughout government who took a cut at our book uh, before we ended up publishing it. But to your question, 
I think the the main difference between the previous waves of jihadist support in the United States is that idea of geographic or socioeconomic or uh, even population-based concentration. You know, previous waves of support for a group like Al Qaeda tend to be concentrated in uh, single communities or concentrated in specific areas. For instance, prior to the Islamic State, the main uh, wave of homegrown uh, jihadist support in the United States was the wave of young individuals from Minneapolis and St. Paul and from other Somali communities in the United States who traveled to Somalia to join al-Shabaab. I use that as an example, not only as the sole example, but also because I think it contrasts this from the ISIS mobilization very well. In that al-Shabaab mobilization, uh, you had a lot of very tightly networked individuals who are going for a single uh, geopolitical grievance for the most part, that Ethiopia had just uh, intervened in Somalia and there was a call within that community to return to a land where they had, uh, you know, ethnic ties, uh, deep religious ties, uh, deep family and social ties and go to fight. Whereas I think in this modern ISIS wave, you saw the nexus of three different types of ISIS's narratives uh, conjoining together and impacting a number of people from across those spectrums that we talked about before. And the three ones to note is first, uh, first the idea of the caliphate, which you know obviously we have to point out here that you know this is a pretty warped understanding of the reestablishment of the caliphate by most um, uh, terms of Islamic law and scholarship. But for a lot of Americans who were interested in this sort of uh, uh, thematic approach or didn't have the scholarly prerequisites to be able to assess different claims, you know, that's a very standalone moment uh, in Islamic history. And for them, they felt like their support, regardless of, you know, other types of backgrounds, that all of it needed to go towards to support the new caliphate. Uh, the other aspect of it is, you know, social media. And we look at it as the glue uh, that held ISIS support in the United States together without sort of the physical networks that ISIS was able to set up for recruitment uh, in other countries, specifically in uh, the Middle East, in North Africa, in Western Europe, in Central Asia, and the former Soviet Union. In the United States, uh, the glue holding together the recruits and the recruiters uh, was this access to English language social media and Islamic, to pro-Islamic state social media. And that's able to reach a wide array of people, people who you would previously think about as being attracted to this, all the way to you know uh, a mom tweeting out uh, propaganda for ISIS in her basement in small town Missouri, for instance. And then the last factor of it, which Seamus spoke about before, is you know there's a lot of folks who were attracted to this understanding of violence. And I think ISIS unlike many of its predecessors, made a claim towards people who were, you know, had a disaffected past or had not lived up to the standards of what they were proclaiming uh, for its entirety. You know, whether it, you had a criminal background or a previous proclivity to violence or something that would, I guess, traditionally put you off the path of living your life in the way that the group was prescribing, ISIS took those people in and said, hey, you know, we don't care about it. This is your chance to redeem yourself fighting for the caliphate allows you to be absolved of whatever you've done in your past. And I think that was attractive to a, a large uh, swath of people. And, and, and I'm gonna to wanna to come to back to that later because I think that has some real analogies to other extremist movements we're seeing in the US, but I cut you off, Shamus. Did you want to add to that? No, I just wanna to, to harken back a little bit to what um, Bennett just said. I think it's an important point. Um, obviously I agree with my co-author, but um, <laughs> The, the fact that they had a message is one thing, but they also had a product, right? The, the product of the so-called caliphate <clears throat> was that driver for a lot of um, Americans. And so we can't discount that. And I think also the, the most important point was basically the democratization of recruitment. And so if you were a young woman from Indiana who wanted to um, travel to Syria and Iraq, it wasn't particularly hard in 2015 to reach out to a recruiter in, on, tel on Twitter and say, this is what I wanna do, how do I get there and who do I talk to, right? And so you're lowering the bar for folks to be able to join the movement in ways you hadn't seen before. Uh, you know, think back to the Al Qaeda days, you know, Adam Gadan, you know, the American propagandist uh, who um, would put out these 30 to 40 minute diatribes about how great Al Qaeda was. And that's all well and good, but that was more of a megaphone, right? You're kind of putting the message out and hoping someone listens. It's a different dynamic uh, when it's a whisper, right? And it's constant in your ear. And so these folks were in Raqqa, were systematically reaching out to Americans um, every day and, and churning out more and more 
um, information and connections that they wouldn't ha normally have during the Al-Qaeda days. So the interactivity of, of social media can't be discounted. Well, I, I think that that, that is so important. And I, and I will tell you that when I was principal deputy and acting assistant attorney general, every criminal complaint did come across my desk and there was not a single one that involved um, terrorism related charges related to ISIS that did not have a social media component. By that mean, I mean part of the affidavit in support of an arrest warrant or part of the indictment charging language would go through the use of social media by the target defendant or defendants and how they either communicated with, with members of ISIS uh, you know, in country or with other recruiters here in the US or oftentimes with undercover um, online personas. There was always an element of the use of, I shouldn't call it all social media, but social media plus um, internet communications, digital communications. So uh, yet, and, and I, I will admit that looking at your book, I think sometimes I have fallen into what I think you guys have criticized a little bit as a sim simplistic notion of online radicalization. And you call that a bit of a misnomer in your book and, and argue instead that the more apt term is online mobilization. So, so Seamus, what, what do you mean by this? And what other factors then are you suggesting are contributing? I assume by what you mean by that is, well, not assume because I, I read it, but that it, it's not just radicalization online. There's other factors that contribute. And so talk to us a little bit about that. Um, and I would be loath to, to disagree with the leadership of DOJ at the time, but uh, <laughs> let me add a little bit more um, from an outsider's perspective on that. Um, yeah, despite my boyish good looks, um, I'm not a huge believer in this idea of online only radicalization. Um, so if you, if a gentleman gets arrested for terrorism, you know, the Associated Press or the New York Times will pull their Facebook profile, see a black flag and say, this guy was radicalized online. And there is some truth in that, obviously, for the connectivity, but um, they're online, but online in the same room with their best friend watching Anwar Laki videos. And so a lot of these cases, you saw an offline component and that offline component helped push the individual um, towards a, a mobilization to action. Um, you are more likely, again, to join a terrorist organization if your best friend joined a terrorist organization. You're more likely to commit a terrorist attack if four of your friends in Columbus, Ohio also think it's a great attack, right? Uh, it's the same reason why you know, you're more likely to do anything else is, is it's these trusted members uh, of society. And so I, I really, we can't discount online. Um, I mean, it's the reason why that kid from Indiana can get on a plane uh, or there's three girls from Denver who jumped on a plane uh, and got turned around in, in, in Germany that we talk about. Um, you know, they got that by connecting with folks online, um, but there was three girls there together, right? Uh, and talking about that and discussing these issues and, and going from there. And so you can't discount the family and friend dynamic. I think that's also true if you look at the European cases, right? There's a reason why 5,000 folks traveled from, from Europe to, to Syria and Iraq, and it wasn't you know, just the internet, right? A good example of that would be uh, Minneapolis, um, St. Paul area had two dozen folks travel to, to join the Islamic State. Uh, a, everyone would say, you know, they did that um, because of the online space or um, because of Somali diaspora or some kind of simplistic look at that. But if you look at um, a similar population breakdown in, say, Lewiston, Maine, with a large Somali American population, um, had zero cases. Now, I've been to Lewiston, Maine. It's a, it's a lovely place with a mill and a, and a river, and, but it's got internet, right? And so uh, it's not just the internet. It comes down to these personal connections. So listening to that, I wonder if you think that there is any difference then between what drove groups, because you men mentioned a number of groups to tr attempt to travel, to actually join ISIS. So at the beginning of the caliphate, if you will, the, the biggest threat we saw at DOJ was from the traveler, those who were physically trying to go either to be soldiers in the caliphate or to provide other services as part of this new um, state, at least as they were promoting it. And I, I, I agree, what I saw, at least from my vantage point, did seem to be that the, these were people that were doing it together. We had occasionally one-offs, but a lot of times it was two or three or even more. 
who decided to travel. Do you think that's different though when we started to, to see the actual plotting of terrorist attacks here in the US? And we saw that transition sometime in that sort of 2016 period as ISIS was, was losing some of the physical battle overseas and it started urging supporters to commit attacks at home as opposed to travel. Do you think you saw any difference in this notion of sort of lone actors versus group activity? But yeah, I, there was, a, a, sorry, if I can go ahead, that's definitely from our vantage point, something we note in the book is the gradual shift over time uh, from sometimes the same category, sometimes different categories of Americans who shifted their focus and interest from travel uh, to plotting attacks in the United States. That's enabled by a number of factors. You brought up one, uh, which is, you know, just the logistics of it. You know, as ISIS started to lose territory in Syria and Iraq, and particularly in Syria, you know, there was a series of efforts in 2016, especially to take back um, some of the border areas in Syria with Turkey that ISIS has controlled and their loss of those territories prevented a lot of the foreign fighter intake, not just from the United States, but from other countries as well. But there's also a strategic uh, guidance from the organization. And it starts, I think, at the broadest strategic level down to the individual tactical level. So you have um, the spokesperson of the Islamic State, uh, Abu Muhammad al Nani, coming out with a series of speeches uh, in 2015 and 2016, where essentially what he's telling Western supporters is, look, like, uh, I guess the terminology he uses, you know, if the tyrants have shut the gates of travel in your face, then open the gates of jihad for them. You know, so directly encouraging the followers of the Islamic State, if they hadn't yet left for the caliphate, to just stay in place and conduct attacks. That's at the broadest strategic level. But then in the individual American cases, we also see this dynamic playing out at the tactical level. In uh, 2016, for instance, there's a, a gentleman in New York named uh, Emmanuel Lutchman. And Lutchman uh, exemplifies some of the shift because, you know, he's having a conversation with uh, Junaid Hussein one of the individuals in Raqqa that Seamus mentioned earlier, whose basic modus operandi it was to reach out to American and British and other Anglophone ISIS speakers in the West, or uh, English speakers um, and ISIS supporters in the West and encourage them to conduct some sort of action on behalf of the Islamic State. Luchman reaches out to Hussein and says, hey, look, I'm interested in travel. Uh, I want to come join the caliphate. Uh, how do I buy a ticket? How do I get all of this set up? And instead, Hussein tells him, no, uh, I don't think it's worth your time. I think instead you should try to plan an attack. Here's a list of a bunch of uh, Christmas and New Year's Day gatherings in your town. Try to start figuring out ways that you can attack it. So you see it starting at this top level of Islamic State and how it's orienting itself towards its Western supporters that then permeates down to individual interaction between American ISIS supporters and their handlers overseas. So that, that transitions me right into a question about this idea of virtual entrepreneurs as the recruiters. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about, and either one of you or both of you, about how you use that term in the book and who does that apply to? I think it applies to the Junaid Hussains who are over in country recruiting, but does it also apply to people in this country? Go ahead, Beth. I was going to default to you on the, the virtual entrepreneurs question, but. Uh. <laughs> yes, I mean, listen, the, 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 the virtual entrepreneurs is, a, we tried to make that happen. I'm not sure it's going to go into lexicon, but um, a virtual attack planners, right? Uh, the, the FBI called them um, the Legion, or the Legion of Doom, very dramatic fashion, typical FBI fashion, right? These were uh, six or seven folks, um, mostly in Raqqa, all in the same computer lab, trading phones back and forth and systematically reaching out to Americans uh, in, in the States. And so we had about a dozen plots that were connected to Junaid Hussein or Sally Jones or Al Sudani or, or a number of these kind of prominent um, ISIS supporters. So ISIS basically said to them, you can spend 12 hours a day sitting in this computer lab, reaching out to um, Europeans and Americans and try to commit, get them to commit an attack. So they gave them the freedom to do it. And they said, you know, doesn't matter on the op, um, just make something happen. And these guys made it easy. So, um, you know, there's a case out of Ohio of a, a young man who wanted to go join ISIS and he reaches out to um, Junaid Hussein and Junaid says, listen, you don't want to come over here. It's like, it's kind of a mess. What you want to do instead is um, behead a local police officer here uh, and, or a, a local military officer. And the guy says, well, I don't know any military officers. 
well, Junaid had just hacked a bunch of military personal information and, and gave him the address of every military officer around Columbus, Ohio, uh, and then gave him a link on Amazon to buy a knife and then told him exactly where to upload the, the, the beheading video on Telegram, right? So again, if you're lowering the bar of radical recruitment, you're also lowering the bar of operational planning. And so you're trying to make it easy a little bit. And so these guys were setting themselves up for a number of successful attacks. And even if they weren't successful, right? If an individual got killed um, and, and wasn't able to, to kill anyone else, um, they still clear that as an attack. They're trying to, to, to sow fear uh, in America, right? And they were relatively successful on it. In fact, if you look at the domestic plotting lines, it goes like this, right? 2016, 17 timeframe. And then once DOD gets in the game and starts taking these individuals um, through a series of targeted strikes off the battlefield, that number drops dramatically. And that what it tells you is, is the fact that these folks are, these rock stars in, in Raqqa are reaching out to these Americans, that did matter for why people decided to, to commit an attack. Um, they were pushing these guys on in a way that we hadn't seen before. Now, one other thing to think about is, um, listen, we, we, we can't discount how, how creative the FBI got at some point, right? So we talk about in, in the book, uh, a man named uh, Muhammad Jala from Virginia. And so um, Jala is a former National Guard guy and he gets on a plane and goes to Nigeria, meets up with an ISIS uh, operative there. And he's on his way to go to Libya on a bus and, and the, the tire goes flat and because of course it does. And he gets turned around and comes back to the States. When he gets back to the States, he reaches out to one of these virtual entrepreneurs, a guy named Al Sudani. And Sudani says, um, you know, send me some money and you should commit an attack in the US. And, but here's, the, here's the, the tricky thing. Sudani then connects him with a trusted operative for um, Jala to co coordinate with. He says, this is my guy, you should talk to him. He'll set you up with everything you need to do. What Al Sudani doesn't know is that trusted operative is an FBI undercover agent. Right? The FBI had been, had been working a persona for a number of years. And when basically Sudani, a guy in Raqqa, was feeding uh, American ISIS supporters to the FBI in real time and not real, realizing it. So the FBI was getting quite good at interjecting themselves into the process earlier on. Um, so your, you, so many questions I have just from your response there, but I want to, um, to address in particular the ability of recruiters to mobilize U.S. persons to commit attacks here. Reminds me of something that my counterparts in the FBI would speak about frequently when we were really at the sort of the height of the um, operational threat uh, here in, in the US. And that is that they frequently talked about the flash to bang of an ISIS inspired terror attack being so brief, particularly as compared to um, Al Qaeda oper operation, operationalization in the US that it really pre prevent, presented unique challenges for US law enforcement. And I think the Jala case is shows this because at any point there's this nervousness about when do we need to stop this even if we might be short of actually having a prosecute you know a serious prosecutable case obviously the number one priority is to present prevent a terror attack always but if you can do that and also be able to hold a person accountable you know that's better because otherwise the person continues to to present a threat to us interests. Um, and so this flash to bang phenomenon, uh, Bennett, maybe I'll kick this over to you. Do, is that something that your research also bore out that there was a difference here? Um, par partly, I think, because of the impact of the internet and the ability to communicate that way, the virtual entrepreneurs and other things. Is that something your research bore out? Absolutely. Uh, you know, every individual we talked about on the law enforcement side of things talked about this decrease uh, in the flash to bang ratio and what it entails for uh, strategies to interdict and intercept terrorists before they commit attack. And I should point out as well, because I know probably there's a question coming about this later on in the discussion. It doesn't just apply to ISIS. You know, I think across the board, a number of extremist groups in the United States have taken advantage of ongoing trends in how terrorist groups conceive of themselves organizationally uh, and other factors related to developments in digital communications technology, like you mentioned, to lessen the amount of time where somebody's on day one of their recruitment and radicalization process to when they actually go ahead and decide to conduct an attack. 
And that sort of ideological understanding of how terrorist organizations should operate. I think a lot of terrorist groups are seizing on the opportunity of cr creating more decentralized networks, which is an especially large problem, I think, for law enforcement, because the entirety of, uh, I think, the way that uh, sort of prosecutions and investigations occur rely on understanding and picking apart a lot of these connections to different people between recruits and leadership, between recruits and other recruits. And if the number of those different linkages are going down, it becomes harder to identify. Why I think that that's important and what factors do I think are enabling it? Well, social media is a big one, of course. You know, we talk about, you know, echo chambers and how individuals that are constantly, you know, being bombarded with this type of ideology and propaganda can radicalize and then mobilize in a, in a shorter amount of time. But there's other factors as well, I think, and some of them include the ever decreasing age of terrorist suspects. You know, uh, an individual at 17, 18, 19 is far more likely to make a rash decision about should I commit violence or not, with less potential for at least federal authorities to step in and stop that person from doing that. Uh, than it would be for, you know, somebody who's a lot older, older on in the game. We have to talk also about, you know, the increasing nexus between mental health issues and terrorism as well in this regard. And then the second thing, and this is not a, uh, by any means, a political statement, it's just a statement of fact in the United States, is that there's very easy access to firearms here. Uh, that enables, I think, the and shortens the amount of time vis-a-vis, -vis, if you were to compare the United States to other countries, that somebody's able to, you know, immediately step up get all the uh, you know, command and control and get all the mechanisms in place that they would need to conduct an attack in the United States. There's also, I mean, I would add, there's also policy ramifications to the shortening of, of Flash to Bay. And so, um, you know, we interviewed FBI leadership a few months ago uh, and they would say that, listen, the, the tempo of, of cases is not 2015, but it's also not the quiet time of 2005. Uh, and they would say, yeah, we would say, listen, you're, we're not seeing any material support terrorism cases being brought up. And they'd say, well, that's not the total tonnage of what we're looking at. Um, you've got a number of, of um, FBI investigations getting kicked to the state and local level. You've got a number of individuals getting arrested for gun charges or drug charges. And that's, um, from the FBI perspective, all well and good because you've got the person off the streets. Um, but from a policy uh, issue, you know, does that individual go into prison does the Bureau of Prisons know that individual is a jihadist? Um, do they spend, if they're spending two years in prison for a gun charge and they, you know, normally would get 20 years for material support, you know, what are you gonna do in, in two years? Uh, if they're state and local uh, arrest, um, those, those charges tend to be lesser and the sentences tend to be lesser. And those individuals move into a state level prison, which doesn't have the same apparatus for communications monitoring that you would have at a federal level. Uh, and so then you have all of those things that happen and these folks are getting out quicker than you would for a material support case. And so flash to bang, you understand why the FBI is, is, is um, quick on the trigger when it comes to an arrest in some of these cases, especially as more and more violence is happening, but uh, there are some um, downstream effects we can't ignore. That's a really important point. Um, and like you say, with a lot of downstream effects, not just in this extremist movement, but in others. And I want to move to that, but I want to do that before they want to do remind people. Um, I have another question I want to ask, and then I'm going to um, start taking questions out of the Q&A. There are a couple there, but please do put your questions into the Q&A. Um, but given what both of you have just been saying, and, and frankly, giving my own personal interest, because since leaving government, I've done a fair bit of work um, to use legal tools, even from the private, you know, outside of government perspective to try to combat some of the threat of our own right wing extremism here in the US. And that includes um, armed uh, unlawful militia extremism, which we are seeing more and more. And I have said in other um, on other panels and in other discussions that I feel like in many ways I've seen this movie before, because um, just as ISIS was really uh, so adept at using social media to and other digital tools to propagandize further its strategic aims, aims recruit and mobilize. Um, I am seeing all those same things in the right-wing extremist space. I am also seeing, similar to um, what we saw with ISIS, that our social media and tech platforms 
are slow to respond. So for example, in the summer of 2014, when we had the beheadings of US uh, persons, as well as persons from Western Europe and Southeast Asia and elsewhere, um, and we had these things go viral over social media, even though those dramatic videos came down relatively quickly, so much other content, it really took a while before the big social media companies, you know, got serious about taking that content down. And, um, and I had trips out to the West Coast to meet with them. Many, many people in government met with social media companies on a lot of occasions. Now, eventually, the big ones, at least, did adjust, adjust their policies and become, I think, much more proactive in, in taking down uh, violent and extremist content. Um, certainly there's plenty of platforms that still will allow it, but the big ones, the Facebooks, the Twitters, it's the YouTubes, et cetera. I, then I feel like we're going through the whole thing again when it comes to far right-wing extremism. So much violent content, so much um, uh, propagandizing and recruitment online. And again, the social media companies very slow to sort of recognize that threat and do something about it. Now we have seen just now, even though this threat's been building for several years, we are seeing again, more proactive steps Facebook announcing that it was taking down groups associated with the QAnon conspiracy, as well as armed uh, unlawful militia groups, Twitter taking down some content. So I guess I, um, I just want to posit to you all as researchers, you know, are you seeing these similar trends in the use of social media and the dangerousness of it, uh, the way it, it, it facilitates um, extremist organizations, and what can we learn from, you know, what you researched and what you saw with respect to a foreign terrorist organization, what can we learn from that when we're trying to com combat the threat right here of, of, of domestic terrorism? Yeah. And I, I'd like to hear from both of you on that, so whatever order you want to go. Sure, maybe I can start about it and we can and go from there. So I think you hit the nail on the head. I mean, the social media companies are completely behind the, the curve when it comes to uh, far-right extremist movements online. Uh, it, it very much reminds me of 2014, 15 timeframe. Uh, and now some of that is, there's, there's a twofold issue, right? One is they've been staffing up for the last four years to deal with ISIS, Al Qaeda, and that type of thing. And so you can train your folks on, on logos and videos and you know, main leaders you should take down. That gets relatively easy. It's a little bit harder when you've got to train the same set of folks on militia movements, of which they change their name every five minutes to... Uh, the intricacies of the Boogaloo movement, which I'm still trying to figure out, right? So um, these things have little quirks that have to be um, taught up, up to um, content moderators for removal. There's another thing I think we, we can't discount um, that I think is, is in many ways more concerning than the homegrown jihadist threat, which is the offline dynamics for um, militias and far-right extremists is um, much more important um, than the jihadist sphere. So. By that, I mean, you look at the, the case of the Michigan governor um, who was uh, a victim of a, a, a potential attack um, by a number of militia members. These individuals organized at a number of rallies for, uh, for a couple months at a time. They organized online. They did it out in the open. Um, and, and the reason why you're able to recruit 13 people, um, I can't remember in the last 10 years when you've had 13 people arrested at the same time for um, uh, jihadist activity. Um, and that is has to do with also the fact that the material support to terrorism clause allows for the FBI to interject themselves earlier on the process for um, jihadists, and they don't have that similar dynamic when it comes to uh, far right extremists. So we are completely behind the ball when it comes to far right extremism, uh, and and I'm I'm worried that the time to learn up on that is is quickly um, dissipating, um, as also frankly. These folks are moving more and more to niche platforms too, um, and those niche platforms, you know, it's one thing to be on Telegram; it's another thing to be, be on ten different Telegrams. Um, ISIS is largely concentrated on on one platform. The other platforms that are left for the far right extremists tend to be kind of free speech adherents uh, through and through, and and are not going to do content moderation, or in fact don't have the manpower to do content moderation. Uh, and so we're not going to see the same level of of takedown that you saw in the past. And from a purely practical standpoint, putting away the, the, the moral and policy ramifications of, of private company moderating speech online, 
um, from a purely practical standpoint, content moderation does work to stop uh, mobilization in many, many respects. And before I pass it to you, Bennett, I just want, uh, you know, the lawyer in me feels compelled to make the point that social media companies and uh, tech sector uh, executives, these are private companies that are not bound by the First Amendment. Only the government can violate your First Amendment rights. Tech companies can take down any content that, that they choose to take down. Yeah, I mean, that's also a really important point, too, is because of the pressure on them for ISIS beheading videos was immense. They were getting oversight letters every week about, you know, why are we able to watch um, Americans be killed overseas on your platforms you're, if you're an American company? I'm not sure that same pressure has been ramped up in the same way on Capitol Hill and also the public in general when it comes to far right extremists. So they're not, they're not being forced to do it um, for public pressure quite yet. Yeah. I don't have much to add. Um, I think Seamus hit most of the nail on the head. I think I've, in the experience, I think that'll be most interesting as we look at the of evolution of how right-wing extremists are operating on social media is if we take basically what happened to ISIS uh, and ISIS supporters between, uh, I wanna say 2016, 2017, as an example of how that could play out when you had platforms like Twitter and Facebook uh, cracking down immensely, issuing new guidance, changing their terms of service, uh, to, you know, basically do a clean sweep content removal of ISIS related content and the effects that that had on ISIS supporters on social media, you know, and this is in many ways, it's a, it's a catch 22. Do you want a large scale, very publicly visible, um, you know, effort by extremists to capitalize support on major public facing platforms? Uh, but at the same time, what that also allows is for law enforcement, uh, other entities to, you know, investigate on social media, uh, delve into the networks, uh, do things like file subpoenas if the company is based in the United States for records that could be useful in investigation. Do you want that side of the problem or alternatively, you know, pushing them to all these different platforms, some of which are not U.S. companies, some of which have protections on them, uh, including end-to-end -end encryption for some, and some have absolutely no interest in cooperating with the government whatsoever. Yes, the downside of that uh, for extremists is that their reach to the public is incredibly limited. But the flip side of that as well is that they may be protected in some cases more from the investigative side of the picture. It's a difficult thing to have to choose, but that choice uh, I've argued before in, in, a, in a couple pieces, it doesn't benefit extremists because at the same time that there's a catch-22 for government, there's also one with extremists. They need public facing platforms in order to recruit, reach out to new people, uh, get support uh, and everything like that. But the flip side of that is the more people they reach out to because of the protection of the internet, you never know when you're going to fall into the Sudani trap uh, from the FBI, you know, when somebody that you meet online is, you know, actually an FBI undercover uh, and you've just walked yourself into a, you know, spreading interstate threats or a material support case based off it. But, yep. No, great points. I, I mean, I, from my own perspective, both in government and now that I'm out, I'd still rather see them off of the main the main uh, platforms because the bar you know those are so easy and they reach so many more people. The barrier to entry to switch to 4chan or 8chan or Parler or whatever is just some people just aren't going to go through that. Um, and and at least in terms of the domestic far right groups, I mean, Facebook by far has been the platform of choice historically. So those folks are still trying to learn these new platforms. Okay, I have been um, hogging all of the question time. So let me take a look over here at the Q and A's and grab some of these. The first one is, is a lot of a congratulations to you, but there is a question in here as well, which is this um, particular, a uh, person is saying that in most of the ISIS cases he looked at, the people he encountered were more attracted to the utopian society idea than the caliphate governance part. And I and I want to ask this of you because I thought about this too when I was looking at the book last night, which is, um, you know, there was but there were marketing and propaganda about both of these things uh, back sort of, you know, 2014, 2015. There was that, you know, the soldier with a kitten and cotton candy in his hands um, and then talking about the education system, the hospital system, etc. in this utopia under Sharia law. And then, you know, on another channel, there'd be, you know, beheadings and, and horrible acts of violence. And what was 
what was more attractive in terms of marketing. I guess I always kind of thought that the utopia gave people a sort of an excuse and out to say, oh, I'm not attracted to the violence. I'm attracted to this, that I didn't, I wasn't sure I totally bought, but maybe, but maybe I'm wrong about that um, and, and, and would be interested in your thoughts about that, um, Shamus. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm generally in your camp. I mean, we, we interviewed a, a number of individuals who came back from ISIS and, you know, by and large, they all said, well, no, I wasn't about violence. I was really about building that society. And um, I'm sure there's some level of truth in that, but I'm also sure that there's some level of, of lying um, because that sounds a little bit better. Um, but let me give you an example of, of, of the country, right? Um, that would be uh, Warren Clark from Texas. So Warren Clark is an African-American 6'2 convert to the faith of lazy eye, right? And he was talking about how great ISIS was um, in Texas. All of his friends actually thought he was an informant because he was just so overtly um, positive about ISIS. And we had a colleague um, uh, whose family had a house in Mosul, um, a nice house in Mosul that was taken over by ISIS. Uh, and when the Iraqi forces took back Mosul, um, they found a number of documents in that, in that house. And one of the documents that we talk about in the book that we, we got access to uh, was the resume and cover letter of Mr. Warren Clark. And he wrote to ISIS, you know, dear ISIS, um, I am a um, teacher at Fort Bend, um, Texas. I believe I can teach English to uh, Islamic State supporters at the University of Mosul. I believe my skill set would be great. And literally attached a resume, right? which was the most American way of joining a foreign terrorist organization I've ever seen, <laughs> right? Uh, and I couldn't believe it when it happened. And, you know, Bennett and Alex and I spent some time at a nondescript hotel in Virginia interviewing the agents who, who worked that case. And, um, and it turned out to be true. And so Mr. Clark got picked up in, in um, towards the end of, of ISIS and he got interviewed by uh, Richard Engel at, at NBC. And they said, you know, Richard said, like, are you kidding me? Like, you saw the beheading videos. You, you said you're joining to go teach English. Like, that's, that's a load of malarkey, right? Um, and, and Clark was able to justify it. He goes, well, listen, we have the death penalty in the US. This is just a different way of death penalty. I was really interested in um, teaching English. I, I think a part of that was true for him, as ridiculous as that sounds. And so it, that was one of the issues when we wrote the book, was, was trying to wrap our head around um, these individuals who would join such a violent group and trying to understand that they were brothers, sisters, sons, and daughters of family members, um, not trying to humanize them too much because at the end of the day they joined a terrorist organization, but trying to figure out what makes them tick. Um, and, and the reasons were varied. Um, but I do think that this idea of utopian society was a, a large driver. I, I would push back a little bit on the question in terms of, you know, these guys didn't necessarily have the ideological chops uh, on that. Um, that is true in a lot of the cases. Uh, you're talking about folks that operate in 280 characters on Twitter and not the say Kutub of the world with a you know, uh, couple hundred page diatribes, right? Um, but occasionally you had cases like Muhammad Khan in, in Chicago who knew exactly what was up um, and could debate the finer points of ISIS ideology, no problem. And so it, it would run the gamut between the people that just kind of converted to, to ISIS and then um, decided to join and then it would join run the game to people that really actually studied this quite a bit and thought that this was a one shot for a caliphate. Um, I, uh, I know I'm not going to be able to get to all of the questions. So I'm going to be pick and choose some that I think will get us into some new areas here. And this one particularly interests me and, and my apologies to to others if we don't get to your question. This question says, during COVID, large segments of society retreated from the public spaces to close family, but importantly also to digital spaces. From the patterns that you've seen in your research, do you think this could lead to an increase in Islamist radicalization in the US and elsewhere and potentially heightened the threat of attack? It's, a, it's an interesting question. I know a lot of folks are, are looking at it. I mean, I think without sort of the ability to examine that question over a longer period of time, uh, we won't be able to have a definitive answer. Just like pre-COVID, you know, it's very difficult for us to be able to say, okay, now we're definitely seeing an increase or now we're not seeing an increase until uh, you know, basically the entire trend is over, but, you know, maybe that's some fault in terms of, you know, our position as social scientists and what we can look at and what we can't, but my hypothesis would be probably not. The reason I say that is because that so much of any type of radicalization, and we've talked about this uh, during this session, whether it's Islamist, 
uh, far right, the real meat on, on the bones of radicalization and recruitment of any group in the United States is their ability to operate offline. You know, at the end of the day, real world connections matter. Being able to, you know, connect with other like-minded individuals and form a coherent and basic plan of action of how you're going to support the group matters. And even, I mean, if I was really going to go out on a limb here, I would think that the things under COVID would restrict some of those dynamics from occurring. But then on the flip side, you also have groups that are not really too mindful about, uh, you know, whatever public health regulations are going on. So it'll be interesting to see if that prediction I just made is wrong in a couple of years, which, you know, very possible, but I wouldn't see the recent round of lockdowns having a substantial effect on, on whether there's recruitment for any extremist group in, in the United States or not. So one thing, I, I would oh, go ahead, Seamus. I guess, I guess one thing is the best, the only good thing about a global pandemic is it's going to prove whether I'm right and wrong on when it comes to online radicalization. So we'll, we'll know the answer. Uh, it'll probably take us a few years. But we'll know the answer on it. I, I would also say there's another dynamic of COVID we can't ignore, which is it has changed the, the operation um, uh, ideas and, and pathways for um, ISIS recruits in the U.S. We're seeing people, not only because ISIS is losing lost territory in say, Iraq, but you know, they're deciding they can't travel um, to X country because there's a lockdown there. And so they're trying to travel to Afghanistan or uh, Libya or Somalia. And so the travel patterns are changing. We're also seeing a, a general frustration of not wanting to travel. And so having to say like, I can't travel, like Minnesota is a great example. There's a case out of Minnesota right now where a gentleman wanted to travel to go join ISIS and he literally could not get a plane ticket um, during COVID. And so he started focusing his, his efforts on domestic plotting. And so we may see a, a level of frustration um, causing, um, unfortunately, some, some level of thwarted or, or successful attacks. And I would just add that at least in the domestic right-wing extremist space, COVID and uh, shutdown orders, masking orders has actually been sort of a coalescing rallying cry for the far-right extremist groups that has allowed them to have something they can be against. And that has been a, a driver of a lot of the violent rhetoric that, that I'm seeing online. So it might not uh, be hugely instrumental in some of the plotting by ISIS adherents, but those on the far right, I think um, it has been a, it, it, it itself has been um, a tool for recruitment and mobilization. Okay, we have time for one more question. And this is kind of a combination of a few that your, that listeners and viewers had and one of my own. I'm gonna uh, close this out with Seamus. Um, so let's assume you were asked to join the new administration and develop a strategy for countering violent extremism in the US. And that includes not only among uh, you know, the general population, but also recognizing that some of these people you just mentioned who are going to be getting out of jail after two and three and four years um, are going to be back in the population. What would you do? And I asked this to Seamus because he used to be at the National Counterterrorism Center working on uh, these types of issues. What would you do? And, and would it include giving the strategy a different name? Um, yeah, so I, I don't care what you call it. You can call it the flying spaghetti as long as it, it gets done, right? Um, people get hung up on, on terminology. Um, in fact, you know, the Obama administration went through a number of different names, county by extremism, resil community resiliency. The Trump administration um, calls it countering violent Islamist extremism or terrorism prevention. It just, it's the same uh, cake, it's just a different name. Um, what would I do a, in a new administration, um, you know, uh, if you look at the at the pla uh, platform of um, the Biden administration, it was pretty explicit to um, dismantle the DHS Terrorism Prevention Office uh, and to do away with county violence troops and programs um, in general. I think that was a that was a call from civil rights and civil liberties organizations who have historically had um, concerns with what they saw as policing thought. Um, I think that it is one of these things where you know you govern in 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 prose and, and you do that the rest right. So uh, I think when the Biden administration um, gets in, you're, you, they're going to see a different animal there. If I was doing it, I would, I would target it a little bit more um, away from this broad-based dynamic. I don't think you need to do pickup ball at Brian Cole Rec Center in Minneapolis. I don't think that gets you what you want. It doesn't get your target um, demographic, right? I also think, don't think you can do round tables for sovereign citizens about why they shouldn't join 
why they shouldn't have a sovereign citizen ideology, right? What I think is important is this targeted intervention. Um, and we talk about it in, the, in chapter six of the book, um, the Eastern District of New York has uh, something called the DEEP program, which uh, was run by an AUSA there who just got, just could not handle the caseload in 2015 of arrests. And they said, like, listen, we got to figure this out. Let's figure out some disengagement, de-radicalization programs. You know, they use formers, they use mental health professionals, they use a number of different people. That was a bit of a carrot in the stick. They would knock on the door and say, I've got a material support to terrorism case I can make tomorrow. The judge is going to sign off on this. Or you can try this program, right? Now, is someone going to be successful if they've got a carrot and a stick? The jury's still out, but it's still better than nothing. I always go back to um, my time in government sitting um, with family, grieving family members of individuals who joined um, at that time Al-Shabaab or Al-Qaeda, uh, and then begging me for to save their kids, right? Uh, once they get on a plane, there's very little I can do. But before they got on a plane, there was a whole host of red flags that people noticed, like little things that were off, right? And I think it behooves us as a, as a government and as a public in general to provide family members with some, some other options besides 20 years in jail or do nothing and hope the kid doesn't die in Syria, right? I don't ever want to sit across the room from grieving parents anymore. And so I'm not talking about a huge program. You're not talking about huge numbers. I think the book borne that out. Um, but you can do kind of targeted uh, programs that, while still respecting civil rights and civil liberties. Uh, couldn't agree with you more. Um, I really appreciate everyone from joining today. For me, this has been a fantastic discussion. Um, the book is really, really well done. It really does fill a gap, I think, in the literature on these subjects. And the fact, the really on the ground work that the authors did in order to provide this data is really, really exceptional. And I really encourage everyone to pick it up and read it. And with that, I will thank the George Washington University Program on Extremism, thank the authors um, for the invitation to be here today, and thank all of you for joining us. Thank you, Mary.